From Amazon's spheres to Adobe's grayscale building with a colorful interior, some of the world's largest companies redesigned their offices, integrated technology, and modernized the traditional office space. We went inside to explore the decisions behind the design and how it suits each brand's work culture. Our first story is about Samsung's futuristic headquarters, a $300 million office that has access to the outdoors on every floor. Samsung is one of the world's largest tech companies, but it's had a low-key presence in Silicon Valley until this $300 million campus opened in 2015. Let's check it out. This design is about connecting people. And the design started as really two separate buildings. And then we ultimately landed on this idea of these two-story bars that would connect the building on both sides and really define this courtyard space. Originally, uh, this courtyard in one, of our initial, um, in one of our initial designs was actually rectangular. The curves weren't here. It actually, it actually came together in sort of hard edges. We actually ran um, a, a computational script and looked at what a typical day um, would look like on, a, on an office floor, uh, looking at how many calories each employee might burn and how many of their colleagues they might see. And what we found was, was that by studying that, if we began to round these corners and actually create two-story spaces behind these curved sections of glass, that improved people's visibility and actually drew them out into those spaces and allowed them a greater opportunity for collaboration. So how many calories would I burn working at Samsung every day? Uh, probably just in the course of a normal work day. I have to remember what the script said, but it was between seven and 800. Does this space help with productivity? It does. Um, there, there are a couple things <clears throat> that are happening here. First of all, you notice that you're getting a view and natural light from both sides of the space, um, which is important. There's research that's shown how natural light and views help people focus and process information in a more effective way than if they're in a more closed environment. So right now we're in one of the main workspaces of the building. It's sort of an open two-story design with the desks all along the outside here and then a main staircase behind me that connects them. The architect tells me that the goal of this was to sort of get people up out of their desks, moving around, and then just also to be able to see people and see which of their colleagues are free so they could go have a conversation. Have you actually seen people connecting and having these impromptu meetings or is that a sort of goal that isn't playing out in real time? I think it was a goal, but I've actually seen it and I've experienced it myself. And so, for example, I have lots of meetings all over the building from any point uh, during the day, and I'm always bumping into somebody from another department, somebody in my organization, and you know, oh yeah, and by the way, and you sort of find yourself having these by the way conversations. And so I think the design of the building really facilitates people to get up and move around a lot, and then that's where you have those, uh, those encounters. Yeah, I've definitely noticed there's a lot of uh, walking around. I feel like I've even done a fair amount of walking yeah, around I this Yeah, I think space. you can get a, your step count up to about 10,000 without leaving the building during the day. From here, you can really get a good sense of the building design. You can see the public area down below, the first floor of closed office spaces, another open air walkway, offices, open air walkway, and then the top of the building. And really what you're seeing is the office's commitment to getting people outside. With the public area below and the open air floors here, no Samsung employee is more than one floor away from being outside. We wanted people to get up out of their desks and move and actually get out of the building. And, and so rather than having the, the cafe actually inside of the building, we consciously pulled it out across the public space. So rather than this being kind of a, 
more of a typical cafeteria. We wanted to give it, have it more of a dynamic and lighter feel. And it goes back to that whole idea of encouraging people to come and spend time here and potentially engage other workers that they might not normally see during the course of the workday. Employees can choose from around a dozen types of global cuisine, prepared fresh each day. And then there's the other perks on campus. Tennis courts, full court basketball, a gym, a garden, massage rooms, a coffee shop, and the chill zone. So this is the chill zone. There are foosball tables, ping pong tables, arcade games, sports playing on the wall back there. Basically, there's a lot of not work happening in this room, but it's pretty fun. Having this right here in the heart of Silicon Valley allows us to compete very well in that, uh, in that war for talent. And is it working? Absolutely. I think if you look at some of the, the Glassdoor scores and other metrics like that, I think we've made some, some great strides in the last couple of years in terms of having a very, uh, very open and collaborative environment that we've created here for our employees. Do you think other companies in Silicon Valley, other tech firms, uh, will create spaces that are more like this? I think they're going to have to because the younger, let's say, creative talent that these companies are targeting, that they need basically to survive, are expecting spaces like this. I think companies will, if, if they want to continue to attract that talent and, and stay ahead of the curve, they're going to need to consider you know, ideas like this and, and spaces like this. Oh, and also, there are these things called nap pods. I gotta try one out. I guess I kind of want to go to sleep. Oh. Not bad. At LinkedIn's flagship office space, there are more than 75 different types of seating. This feels like a spot for maybe a really quick call or just answering a couple of emails. Work or NBA Jam. Yeah, this is your space. Yeah, this is my space and, and that's your space. Many of these seats were actually meant to be desks. So I think during our initial plans, we had just standard desks in this space with traditional conference rooms and huddle rooms. But the pandemic changed that. How much of what we're seeing in this space is new as a result of the pandemic? 100% of it. This recently opened space is designed for hybrid work, a model that has emerged as the leading choice for LinkedIn and others, with 42% of people with remote-capable jobs working partly at home, according to a February Gallup poll. So what does a hybrid office look like? I toured Building One with the project's leaders to find out, and to get a glimpse into what could be the future of workplace design. Building One is the new hub of LinkedIn's campus in Silicon Valley. It has six floors, roughly 239,000 square feet, and room for about 1,500 employees. Prior to the pandemic, when we looked at this building, really at that point, the main goal was fitting as many people as we could in this space. The original floor plans called for 1,080 individual workstations. The thinking was, one employee, one desk. Once we were sent home during the pandemic, you know, a lot of that changed. And much of what we were trying to solve for before the pandemic was not the same thing that we were looking at at that moment. So with the help of its design partners at NBBJ, LinkedIn retooled the space, cutting the number of desks in half to 569 workstations and adding dozens of new non-traditional seating setups. What did you and LinkedIn learn from the pandemic that would result in the space that we're in right now? I think we really wanted to do a lot of experimentation because we just didn't know. No one had a crystal ball about what the future would actually be, so we wanted to provide as many variety of spaces as possible. The variety starts right when employees walk in. The design does away with a large lobby in favor of a cafe. This is one of my favorite spaces of the buildings. The idea of this space is that the minute you walk in, you feel the buzz, there's people getting coffee, there's people moving throughout the space. The cafe spills into the first of two areas LinkedIn calls its co-working spaces. Think open, non-reserved seating. The co-working area on the second floor was added in the redesign. So we've got primary work points here. Desks with monitors and tall backed booths with ottomans dot the space that, looking back at the original design, was once full of assigned workstations. 
So a space like this is great for those like smaller time periods where you might come in and like work with your team and then go home and do some focus time and or vice versa. Yeah. And that's okay with LinkedIn to, to come in for half the day and work at home for half the day. Yeah, LinkedIn's approach is that we are leading with trust. The idea is that we trust our employees to make the decision that's gonna be best for them and their teams. Coworking is open to anyone in the company for any amount of time. Employees assigned to the building who plan to work there all day will likely move upstairs. The concept behind how the floors are planned is the entry to the building is the most social, and the farther that you get into the space, it becomes more focused. Workers sit in so-called neighborhoods, or areas assigned to their teams. We call this the living room. Neighborhoods are split, about half alternative workspaces and half traditional desks. Those desks are mostly here, in the back. Was this sort of what the whole floor was meant to look like before the pandemic? It is what the whole floor looked like before the pandemic. What led the decision to get rid of desk space? Because we imagined that not everyone was going to come to work eight hours a day. So rather than fill the space with potentially empty desks, of which I still saw plenty, new furniture was added based on something called the postures matrix. The postures matrix is about the amount of time that we imagine a person would be working doing a certain activity combined with the amount of ergonomics to support that. So how long am I meant to spend at this chair here? So as a high table, we imagine that you spend less time compared to like a low standard table. So this would, this would be used maybe 30 to 60 minutes. LinkedIn employees in building one don't have assigned desks. Instead, they can grab a seat anywhere in their neighborhood. But it's not quite hot desking either, as seats don't need to be reserved. Even before the pandemic, our desk utilization was, I think, was around 30 to 40 percent. 30 to 40 percent? Meaning that, like, even though people might be in the office all day, they're at meetings, they're at lunch, uh, yeah, they might be sick, right, or just not in the office. And so now we're really looking at what does that desk utilization look like in a hybrid world. Do you know what that is yet? No. <laughs> <laughs> but in a hybrid office, the individual setup is arguably easier to design for. It's the conference room that's tricky. Here, LinkedIn is again experimenting from conference rooms that look like living rooms. What we wanted to do was to take away the formality of meetings from off-site to on-site and put people in a neutral position where, you, where if you are at home have, as a part of the conversation, you're feeling very comfortable interacting with your colleagues. To conference rooms packed with tech, including cameras positioned at table height that reframe to better show the speaker. So it makes it a little bit more like you're sitting at the table. And cameras that help make the physical digital. When folks are actually writing on, the, on, this, uh, on this whiteboard, typically what you would be doing is writing like this and a camera would be behind you, shadowing you, from, uh, the people from seeing what it is that you're right, actually you doing. you be able to see actually what's going on. This technology ghosts you out so that people that are remote can see what you're writing. Can we test it? Let's do it. All right. I'm standing in front of it now. See what it's capturing? Yeah, I see what you mean. So you have this new space mm -hmm. with all of these new bits of technology and different types of seating. Mm -hmm. Is it meant to encourage people to come back into the office? Um, I think it's meant to welcome people um, if that's where they need to be. But if that person is gonna do their best work and have their best contributions to their team while being remote, that's okay. That flexibility may not be possible for some companies, and others, like Tesla, simply aren't interested. But LinkedIn sees building one as a kind of test, one that others could learn from. To what extent is what we're seeing here in LinkedIn's office the future of work? What we have is an awesome opportunity to experiment and to see what happens over time, and that this is entirely flexible space. It might turn out that what we need are more desks in the future, and that this could be changed into that, or it might turn into a completely different model. But the experimentation and the observation is really the key to seeing what the future is. We're here at Adobe's headquarters in downtown San Jose, and this grayscale building behind me might not be what you'd expect from the makers of Photoshop, but let's check out the inside.
Adobe built its San Jose HQ in 1994. After 20 years, it came time for a redesign. Designer Natalie Engels said it was in need of a more colorful update. You know, when we um, first ventured um, to the space, it is exactly what you would imagine um, from the outside. It was very bank institutional like. Sure. And that's not what tech is. That's specifically not what Adobe is. So when I walk in here as an employee during the morning, and the first thing I see is this vibrant orange color, what is that doing for me? It should um, have the right amount of yellow in it, actually, to have this happiness, a vibrancy, um, but not too vibrant to agitate you. And so we really wanted, especially after people are stuck in traffic, to come in here and just feel refreshed and vibrant and ready to start their day. Color is more than aesthetics at Adobe. It's their business. So Engels and Adobe used color theory throughout the space to think more scientifically about how hues and brightness levels inspire work. So when you think about it from a scientific perspective, that orange, that's very much kind of an invitation for community. What we find is, we find people working down here on their own. They're opting in. It's a place that they want to be. It's been active since we've opened it. Beyond fresh color, Engels designed a variety of spaces to accommodate different types of work. Before the redesign, Adobe had only closed office spaces. The focus then was on giving engineers the quiet space they needed for work. Floors looked like this one. As uh, work has shifted, as generations have changed, it became pretty obvious that they needed to be together. So that meant opening offices up. But Adobe isn't a full open office environment. We really want to create balanced workspace. Do you have the right meeting rooms? Is there a place where you can make phone calls when you're not disturbing others? A workstation or a desk is actually about task work. That's why each floor also has spaces for group and individual focused work. Adobe has these phone booths that are dedicated to special moments in Photoshop's history. This is 1990, the year Photoshop was invented. And they actually have the first version installed on this mat right here. Let's check it out. I suppose a color picker doesn't really matter when you're operating in grayscale. Each floor at Adobe is different. Some, like this one, were more experimental. Tests to see what worked for employees. So now we're into this more open yes. office environment. Yes. I think um, something that's fascinating about this floor is that there are no offices. While everything, everything in life is an experiment, we don't know exactly what's going to work better for you, that's going to work for me. And so there is a spirit of innovation. What we're trying to do is be more innovative. And to do that, you have to experiment more. And you have to almost create a culture and an environment where you can feel that. In a modular room called Lab 82, named after the year Adobe was founded, the company tests ideas in workplace design, including how plants, sounds, colors, and scents can change a meeting. And what we're looking to do is identify the best possible future ways of being able to collaborate. And when something really worked, Engels and Adobe listened. These booths are really popular. Oh, they're so, po they're so popular that we had to come back in and add this whole row. One of the most noticeable upgrades Adobe made in the redesign was the addition of two new cafes. They went from one to three. This space is their cafe called Palettes. It's farm to fork concept. And it really harkens back to what this land was. You know, this whole area was orchards. And so we really wanted to give people a place that um, recognized what the community was. Appreciate it, don't just brush it under the rug. The cafe gets some of its produce from the company-run garden located just outside its doors. We're able to grow about 5,000 pounds of produce that we use in our cafes and in our learning kitchens. And what's really great about it is we have employees come and grow their own produce here on site. We bring master gardeners to teach them different things that they can grow and provide them seeds that they can take home and grow on their own. Adobe wants employees to be healthy, and that means more than eating well. In its wellness center, employees have access to cardio machines, weights, classes, and this. So Adobe has this thing called the Soma Dome, which is basically a guided meditation experience in this pink egg. I have to try it out. I'm getting ocean waves. 
It's relaxing. Adobe's redesign continues on some floors, but across the street, the company is more than doubling its capacity with a new tower set to open in 2022. Is the new office space going to look like this space inside? There will be a lot of the essence of what's happening here, but also trying to think about how people will be using devices differently, how they'll be commuting differently. If you design perfect space for now, for a tower that's gonna open in 2022, you can guarantee that it's not gonna work. Sounds like the experimentation will continue. Entering Marriott's new headquarters is like walking into a hotel. You check in at the front desk, grab a coffee, and tap your card to get inside, where you'll find a hotel room. Well, kind of. We've got a little table, a bed, um, a bench built out of foam core, a ledge built out of foam core. This mock-up room is here for testing. Flex seating areas, here for collaboration and amenities, an additional sweetener to get employees excited to come back to the office. It's some of the things that you would see in a hotel, just kind of some of those ingredients of bringing people together, but just done in a very different way. Mm -hmm. The $600 million space represents Marriott's bet on the future of the physical office. Question is, will it draw Marriott's hybrid workforce back? I took a tour with the project's leaders to find out and discover how Marriott's using the space for work and experimentation. Marriott's new office, located in Bethesda, Maryland, is really a campus. A tower with 785,000 square feet of workspace, and a flagship hotel with 245 rooms, including 13 that will be a little different. This particular room is going to be a sample room for the Westin brand. So this is going to be a Sheridan room, a Moxie hotel room, the courtyard room. Stephanie Lenartz, Marriott's president, was part of a small internal team that helped develop the vision for the new office, in part by touring other office spaces. We went to tech companies out west. We went to other retailers um, to see what they were doing. I wonder, were you also drawing some inspiration from Marriott's own properties. We are experts in hotel design. We know how people are living and working and traveling these days. And we took all of those insights from our core business and put them into this fabulous new um, corporate headquarters and the hotel next door. The hotel-like design starts with the lobby. It was a way for us to think about how do you deconstruct what a hospitality experience is and then infuse that with a workplace and come out with a formula that is very unique. It speaks Marriott, but then it feels like you're going somewhere different. It's trying to transport you somewhere. The design does this in one big way, this video screen. How tall is it? It's over 20 feet tall. Oh my gosh. And it wraps like 65 feet around, uh, which is incredible. But it also has some more subtle nods to travel. So the light, for instance, is something that we designed to cue for travel. It's literally topographic lines. Travel isn't just a reference to Marriott's business, it's also how the company operates. Marriott estimates that even before the pandemic, a third of workers were on the road. So for Jordan Goldstein and the architects at Gensler, that meant building in flexibility, something that's on display just off the lobby in a three-story atrium known as the Hub. What's the point of creating such a flexible, multi-use space like this? Why not just close it off, make it desks, fit more people in? I think for you know Marriott and also for us, it was recognizing that you know, the way people are going to be working, uh, it's not prescriptive. We want to give people choice. Employees could sit here, here, or even work here. People really love these. Es especially on those days when it's not so nice outside, right? You exactly. can still get a walk and talk in. Ac and you can even do it in high heels if you want to. <laughs> <I'm impressed>. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Up one floor before the more traditional workspaces is this lab-like space, which holds a test kitchen, bar, and that mock-up room. We've drawn with a Sharpie yeah, right. where the mirror will be, where the TV will be. And it's all to give you a sense of what this room will feel like. And we can move this wall back six inches and you can actually see that six inches can make a big difference in terms of how a hotel room could feel. But to see how guests actually experience a new room design, Marriott will use those 13 guest rooms being built inside the hotel next door. We didn't have this in our old building. We had sample rooms in a basement, right? And since it was in a basement, there wasn't natural light. There was fake windows and there wasn't real plumbing. Sure. And you certainly couldn't Not stay- Not real hotel rooms. Right, it was like a movie yeah. set. You, couldn't, right. you didn't stay overnight there. But now with our new corporate headquarters, we can do things we never could have done before. 
between the sample rooms and the lab space, Marriott has devoted more than 22,000 square feet of space to innovation. That's balanced with its 16 more traditional work floors, like this one, just upstairs. There are 2,842 workspaces. Most of those are desks, which aren't actually assigned to employees. Instead, the hotel company uses the hoteling model. What are you doing in this space to give people some level of privacy in some sense that they have ownership over their work? Yeah, it's a lot of differential spatial experiences. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you look at where you and I are now, we're in the open, mm -hmm. right? But we walk a few feet this direction over here, we're in a different opportunity to pull aside. So the best way to combat the hard parts of the open office plan is to give people other choice. options. Give them choice, yeah. And that's just what Marriott did when it tweaked the design during the pandemic. Originally, the workspace floors looked like this, mostly individual workstations. Then 25% of those desks were removed, creating a floor plan that looks like this, with couches, tables, and booths. Why take away that 25% of desks and add these new spaces? I think you still do need individual workstations and private space, right? But much of the work that's done in the hotel business, in the case of our company, is collaboration. Marriott's office opened to employees at a time when office use is on the rise. Nationally, workers are returning to offices at the highest rate since the pandemic began, as COVID infection numbers fall and companies increasingly mandate in-office time. Marriott, however, plans to stay hybrid. As people start to come back to the office, even in a hybrid environment, I wonder what role office design has to play in getting them to come to work more. Uh, it's a catalyst, for sure. I deeply believe that hybrid work makes a lot of sense and it can be very successful. But hybrid work does mean that you are part of the time working physically together. When you walk around, if spaces aren't full and people are working remote or traveling, will the investment in this new office space still feel worth it? Because I'm in the hotel and the travel business, I believe people need to be together. That's why everyone's traveling again, right? And I think that's true in the case of work as well. So I'm very confident that this building will be full enough of the time to be well worth the investment. Cisco's revamped New York office is packed with technology. There's tech that tracks. There's 5,000 individual data points that are being constantly collected and harvested in this facility. And tech used for collaboration. Is there any space in this office that doesn't have a camera? No, there isn't. Cisco's smart office is both a showcase of the company's technology and an example of how it sees the workplace evolving. So how does it look? And more importantly, how does it work? I took a tour with the project's leaders and popped into a few meetings to find out. <laughs> Cisco's 59,000 square foot office sits in Midtown Manhattan in one Penn Plaza, exactly where it's been for the last 17 years. But in the last two, it's undergone an $18 million tech-driven redesign. This is one of the few projects where technology was really at the very beginning and pervasive throughout the entire process. In this space, the screens, cameras, and sensors came before the lighting and furniture, which was a new process for both Gensler and Cisco. We really think technology is going to be at the heart of how people design buildings moving forward. So we started it with that layer. To see this tech, all you have to do is look up. The ceiling is littered with tech, each of which doing more than it might appear. So it's hard to miss this camera. Yeah. What is this camera doing? Actually, this is a Meraki security camera, and obviously it's recording people coming in and out of the floor. But it's also got a tripwire built in. We can actually count people as they come in and decrement as they leave. So at any given time, we know the, the overall occupancy of the floor. But to know where people are after they enter the office, Cisco uses its wireless access points, like this one. It's actually tra tracking mobile devices as a proxy for understanding occupancy of space and people, but it's also tracking air quality, temperature, and humidity. Is it tracking my mobile device right yeah, now? It's, so it's it knows... tracking a mobile device. It okay. doesn't know it's you, but it knows there are two mobile devices here because I have one in my pocket as well. Leave the hallway to enter a meeting, and the cameras used to connect employees on video call then pick up the count, tracking the number of participants in the room. While employees may be anonymous, this type of tracking isn't common. Just 1% of companies in a 2022 Gartner poll have sensors that track foot traffic. 43% of companies say they aren't tracking on-site attendance at all. Are employees at all concerned about the tracking that's possible in an office where cameras count the number of bodies in the space? No, I, I don't believe they are. And the reason for that is 
At Cisco, we don't have a set number of days that we expect employees to be in the office. I think if we had different expectations around being in the office, it may feel a little bit different. But because we don't, I think they understand that those insights allow us to make the space the best that it can be for them. Still, these are Cisco products. Other companies that purchase these systems could use them for more specific tracking. Or they could do as Cisco does and feed the data here for employees to see. Really, what we have here is the great ability to show employees space availability. Red is obviously a space that is booked and being used right now, or uh, amber is a space that's booked and not being used, and green is an available space. Let's find a space that we can go yeah, to. Yeah, so, so here's a space right here. Let's, we'll go to this space. Okay. Let's hold that, and that's going to give us four minutes to get over there. Four minutes because in this office, space is meant to be shared. So rooms like the ones lining this hall aren't bookable. The red and green lights are your signal. See, this is our room that we're going to use. Yep. All right. These ad hoc spaces represent one of the biggest changes to Cisco's space, how it's balanced. Take a look at Cisco's floor plan. These spaces are what Cisco considers individual workspaces. These spaces are for teams. In the past, our uh, building was set up where 70% of the space was targeted toward individuals and 30% of the space was targeted toward teams, and we flipped that. That resulted in the 90 collaboration spaces seen here and left just 50 individual desks. I think this is a new era, and I think that when you want to sit by yourself and get work done, you may not choose the office to do that. There are actually about 1,700 employees assigned to this office, but Cisco doesn't expect that they'll all be in on the same day. With hybrid here to stay, we're seeing so much more emphasis on um, amenity spaces, collaboration spaces. People are coming in to be with other people, um, the things that they can't do when they're working at home. Things like brainstorming on a whiteboard or meeting in a 14-person room like this one are now the focus. So what's really interesting about this space is how the space design, how the furnishings and the technology all come together. They come together because Cisco designed the table to work specifically with the camera at the other end, from the placement of the microphones to this matte finish, which helps reflect light up onto the faces of the table. Most noticeable, though, is the table's tapered shape. We shape the table to make sure everybody has a line of sight on the display, right, and can see content. And we also have make sure that people that are remote, that are joining us, actually have line of sight of everybody at the table. Right, because that person all the way at the end is much further to the right than I am, so they should be able to see exactly. every single face down the row. That shape and the exclusion of chairs on the screen side is pervasive in Cisco's space because it says 98% of its meetings will have a remote participant. So who is this conference room designed for? Is it designed for the people who are here at this table or is it designed for the people who are signing in remotely? When, when we think about designing collaboration spaces like this, we spend as much time, if not more, about worrying about the remote participant. We want to make sure there's absolute digital equality. Digital equality. That's an idea that Cisco stressed and something it thinks its hybrid workforce needs. Something that we have all experienced is sometimes you're in a meeting and you're having a hard time breaking in. And especially if you happen to be the only one in the office or the only one working remotely. And here's where the camera can help bring people, or at least their faces, closer. I tested it with colleagues who work in two separate offices. Are you seeing this, this full room? Are you seeing this whole table? No, I'm seeing four chairs. I, same. I just sent you a screen grab. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it's really you're really only seeing like my my side of the room. There is an argument to be made that with all of Cisco's technology and the ability to make every space into a hybrid meeting space, that the office isn't really needed at all. What would you say to that? Well, I think that at the end of the day, people will want to come together, but they're going to come together for different reasons. But for those who'd rather stay home, the tech is here to support that. And that's an example that other companies may follow. So do you expect other companies you work with to want to do tech first, design second? Absolutely. I mean, so many of our clients are interested in seeing this space because of how this was built. I think anyone that's looking to build a new space is going to think this way. So people ask, why spheres? And there are multiple reasons. The spheres are found in nature. We see it in the sun and the moon. We see it in bubbles. We see it even in the pupil of the human eye. Welcome to the spheres. Let's go inside. 
the idea was that every Amazon employee had the opportunity to get up from their desk, to walk over to the spheres, and to come into this kind of environment to think and act differently than they would in the, inside an office building. All of these spaces are intended to create different work environments. When we were designing the campus, we wanted to do something that was super special, not just for our employees and their families, but also for Seattleites. We started thinking about what's missing uh, from the urban environment, and it's generally a link to nature, and so we wanted to link uh, nature to uh, the workplace. There's ample studies that show that walking in the park versus walking on a city street results in you being less stressed. Your cortisol levels are reduced. You can concentrate better. When we decided to do spheres, we found there were many really attractive historical examples. We liked all those things, but we wanted something organic to reflect the purpose of the building. We found it in something called a pentagonal hexacontahedron. If you look at this, this example, this is one of our modules we call a catalan. It's an elongated pentagon of which there would be 60 in order to create an entire sphere. As I hold this, this uh, 3D print up of a Catalan, you'll see behind it the large scale version of it that's inside the sphere structure. And as you look at the building itself, it's very hard to find this module because it's intended to look more like vines growing or a spider web. The biggest challenge by far was how to solve the environmental conditions here. Traditional greenhouses, as you know, are hot and humid. We're trying to create an environment for people during the day and that it's for plants day and at night. We're walking through the 7th Avenue sphere. We call it the forest. A company can hire like the best people and big companies do it all the time. But oftentimes they, they kind of put these people in little boxes, right, in cubicles. They're really not working at their fullest potential. One of the things we wanted to do in the spheres was to create a place where they could learn about something different, be curious about something different. We have Southeast Asian pitcher plants. This is another tropical rhododendron. This is Alocasia portii, slipper orchids from Southeast Asia. This is Begonia seismorii from Vietnam. This is one of my favorite spots here in the spheres. This behind me is one of the largest indoor living walls uh, in the country. The wall stands about 62 feet tall, almost 50 feet wide. It has something in the order of 25,000 individual plants on it. That's a lot of green, you know, that we're looking at. During the day, we have that environment that both of us like, and at night, the temperature lowers to 55 degrees, and the humidity goes up to 85% or more. All the furniture, all the equipment, all the finishes are what we would normally design for outdoor use. In addition to the paths through the forest, there's also this ring path. From here you can see that we can look out to the city, so you get the best of both worlds. The canopy walk was another idea of Amazon's. We wanted to create the opportunity for walking meetings, because we knew that if you are walking between 1.2 and 1.8 miles per hour, you're at the best speed at which to think. Ruby is our largest tree. She came in at 55 feet. It was a major task to get this tree in because the spheres had to be complete when the trees came in because they had to have the environment they needed to thrive and, and live. We had to create an opening at the top of the building after it was complete, big enough to pull in a tree like this. The next stop is the birdcage. The birdcage is a space for conferencing or to just work alone. It is a space that is open like all the rest, but we wanted to give it some privacy. So you'll notice the vines that are growing up all the way from the floor below up onto the birdcage to provide that privacy screen. Just one more floor. Well, this is our fourth floor. It's under the sky. You can look 360 degrees around the city. It's kind of fun, isn't it? Majority of people that are being born today will never see the Milky Way because of light pollution and living in cities. We need to counteract that with as many different good ideas as we can. The spheres was one of those good ideas. To not only create alternative places to work, but to reintroduce nature into the middle of the city. Street trees are not enough. We need to go farther. <laughs>